Today I'm going to be making an injection mold for a guitar pick. I had a viewer who contacted me about making a mold for guitar picks. His name is Justin and he has his own YouTube channel and I'll put a link, a card above or a link below to his channel. And it's called uh, Neo Guitar Concepts. He asked me to make a mold and he wants to try this out and I think, you know, if it's successful he's going to end up getting his own injection molding machine. At least that's the idea. So what I'm going to do is to take you through the whole process from receiving the CAD file to him, doing some initial analysis, designing the mold, making the mold, making some test parts out of Delrin, ABS, and polypropylene, and then finally at the end I'll have a clip of him playing his guitar with one of the picks that I sent to him. So let's head to the computer. This is the 3D CAD file I got from Justin. It's pretty straightforward. It's actually fairly simple. There are a few things that I like to do when I first get a part. The first thing is to check for draft. I mean, I can look at this already and tell that there's no draft on these walls, but there's a nice tool within Fusion 360 specifically for this purpose, which is draft analysis. I have this set up to show me anything that has less than two degrees in either direction. So first I'll select the body, and then for direction I'll select this plane here because this is Basically, this line here is the pull direction for separating the two halves of the mold. And it's already highlighting in red the walls that have no draft. So I want to go ahead and add draft to this. I've already done it down here, as you can see. But that's pretty straightforward. I'll just go show you how I did that. It uses the draft command. And so again, I'll select the same pull direction. And then I'll select the faces that I want to add draft to. I usually start out with more draft than I'm going to use, just so I can make sure that it goes in the correct direction, which it did. So then I'll set it to the draft that I actually want. And now I have draft on those walls. Now regarding this right here, I decided to take a different approach to this, which is to effectively add the draft with the milling rather than to add the draft in the 3D model. But before I get to that, there's another thing that I'd like to check, and always check, in fact, which is to make sure that I have enough clamping force for this part. Now, the clamping force is based on the cross-section of the part, which is this area here plus all of those areas. So here's an easy way to figure out the cross-section. The first thing I do is I create a, an offset plane, and I'm going to select that face right there. I don't really need to create an offset plane, it just makes it easier, as you'll see, to select things. Then I want to create a sketch on that offset plane, and I will project by typing P, and then selecting the outermost curves for the part. I want the outermost curves because the pressure is going to be trying to push the mold apart for all of this area covered by plastic, as you can see here. So when I finish that and finish the sketch, you can see I have an enclosed sketch right there, and if I click on this, this shows me the cross-section. So this is saying that the part has a cross-section of 0.7 square inches. To figure how much clamping force I need, I'll use a calculator. The rule of thumb that I use is 2.5 times the cross-sectional area in square inches. So again, the cross-section was 0.7. So 2.5, oops, I was trying to do that with a mouse. I'll just do it with the keyboard. 2.5 times 0.7 means that I need 1.75 tons. That's certainly within the capabilities of my machine, but molding two of these may not be in the capabilities of my smaller machines that only have two tons of clamping force. So now that I know that, I can go ahead and delete these features, or I can keep them, but I don't really need them. So one thing that I often do is I just, uh, actually it's, I don't see why it's doing it here. Let me try again. Sometimes, there we go. I want to suppress feature, and then I guess I could not suppress them both together. Now, suppressing the features that way means that they're still in here if I make changes, so I can check it without having to recreate it, but they're not going to interfere with working on the mold. This is the mold that I created. It has uh, two halves, as you can see there, 
And the way that I usually create these molds is, let me back up and start from the beginning. I start by creating just one half, and this is, I, I can either call it the core of the cavity, typically um, on larger machines they're called A and B. It doesn't really matter in this case because in a sense they're both cavity. The other thing is I have the part placed about where I want it to be. And then the next thing is to subtract this part from here. As you can see when I hide this, we now have basically the inverse of the part in the mold. And then I'll do the same thing for the other half, which as you can see is much simpler. There's no lettering or anything else on that half. Now because of the lettering, etc., I know it's going to stick to this half. In any event, uh, the next thing that I would typically work on are the alignment pins. So I have alignment pins on both sides. On this side, they're deeper. The idea is that I'm using alignment pins that are half an inch long, and so they stick out just a little bit on this side. And that allows them to provide alignment, but because they're only sticking out a small amount, they don't bind when you try to take the mold halves apart. So going back to the other half, the one that's more interesting with the details, the next thing that I do is add the, the gate, which I have to show. And the idea of the gate is you want it in a place that is hopefully not going to interfere with the use of, of whatever you're making. In this particular case, this is the most important area because this is where you pick against the strings on the guitar. And then of course you want these areas around here not to have the gate because that would interfere with how it feels in your hand. So I figured this was the least obtrusive place to put the gate. Now for applications like this, I try to make the gate as small as I can because the smaller the gate, the less obtrusive it is. I mean a larger gate would allow the plastic to flow better, but then you have more of an area that you have to clean up to get rid of the vestiges of the gate. So this gate is a square gate, which is 40 thousandths of an inch on e either side. Then I add the round end for the runner, which is this part here, or the sprue, I should say. And I have it going directly into the part. You know, I know people think that you need to have a a cold plug for cold parts of the plastic, but for these small machines, you can get away with injecting straight into, into the part like this. And then again, subtracting that from the two halves of the mold. I cut the blanks that I'm gonna to use to make the mold halves out of a long bar of aluminum, and so the sides are actually not going to be the exact dimensions and they're going to be rough cuts. So typically what I do is I clean one of the sides up just by hand in the machine. And then the next thing that I do is I want to pick up this back left corner, which you can see me doing here. And then on the machine, I just press the zero for X and Y. Once that's done, then I add a probing operation. And as you can see here, it's uh, probing to pick up the back left corner The next operation is a facing operation, and this is using my TriFly from Shrum Solutions, which does a great job. You may be wondering why I'm moving in the Y direction rather than in the X direction, and that's because I run out of X travel sometimes if I go in the X direction. I have a contour here, which as you can see is cleaning up the ends and setting it to the exact length that I want. Then I can take it out, deburr it, flip it over, put it back in, and then tighten the clamp a little bit, and then give it a, a good whack with a dead blow hammer so that I can ensure that it's uh, down on the, the parallels tight. Then it's time to probe on this side again. And then facing, which I've already shown you, so I'll skip to the next one. And the next one is the pocketing operation, which is using a fairly small end mill. This is actually doing roughing. This is a 1 16th inch diameter flat end mill. Then we have the spot drilling, drilling and pocketing, and then finally contouring of the holes for the alignment pins. 
These are standard operations. I make the holes slightly larger so that on one side the alignment pin actually on both sides slips in fairly easily and then I use removable Loctite to hold them in position. And then I rough out the runner, leaving a little bit of extra material and then come back with a smaller end mill to clear it out so that it's nice and smooth and has the right shape and then also mills the gate. And then I come back with a 132nd inch flat end mill to make sure that I have a flat surface in all the places and I've removed uh, some of the extra material. I have very close spacing on the milling here so that it reduces the chance of tooling marks showing up on the injection molded part without me having to polish the mold afterwards. To clean up these curved surfaces, I use a 132nd inch ball end mill using the scallop toolpath, and that does a really good job of blending that in. Back to the 132nd inch flat end mill, I clean up the drafted surfaces that are straight, and then also a little bit around the outside. And finally the fun part, which is to engrave the lettering here. This is using a engraving bit that has a 5 thousandths of an inch diameter tip so that it's able to get into all of the, the tiny details. You certainly can't see it during the milling and it's hard to see in person. Here is what the toolpath looks like and you can see that it does a pretty good job of cleaning up. It doesn't clean up perfectly, but it's gonna look fine once it's injection molded. I'm using some white Delrin for this test after previously using some white polypropylene and then some black ABS. And one of the things that you'll see is that there's still a little bit of the black ABS. I haven't completely purged it. Now this sticks pretty well because it shrinks a little bit, so I just use a knife to pry it up and it comes away fairly easily. If you look here, you can see the details are pretty easy to see. This is kind of what it looks like when you're looking at it with your eyes. And then here's a close-up showing the polypropylene and the ABS together. You can see I didn't dry the ABS and so it has a lot of streaking and as it turned out that made it rather brittle. That was a fun project to do. Now as I mentioned I'm going to have a clip right after this of Justin playing with one of the picks that I sent him. I want to thank all of my Patreons who are supporting me. Please help me grow the channel by subscribing, commenting below, giving me a thumbs up, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.